QUT acknowledges the First Nations owners of the lands on where we gather today and pay our respects to the elders, laws, customs and creation spirits of this country. For thousands of years, the First Nations owners have gathered to share their knowledge and stories. We pay our respects to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and acknowledge the important role they play within our communities. We recognise their long and continuing connection to country, the lands, winds and waters throughout Australia. We recognise that these lands have always been places of teaching, researching and learning. Hello everyone and welcome to our Educator Community Webinar for October. It's lovely to have you all here with us. Um, great to see some familiar faces coming back again um, to join us in the webinar. Uh, as you heard, we are hosting today's session from um, QUT in Brisbane, which is on Turrbal and Yagara country. And we'd love to give you an opportunity to um, include the traditional country that you're on um, today as well. So we acknowledge that we are all um, working from different places all across the country today. So if you take a moment to just um, introduce yourself into the chat um, and include the name of the land that you're working from today, that would be really great. Um, while you're doing that, I'll just introduce the team um, from PCC for You who's on the webinar today. So there's um, Kylie Ash, who's the National uh, Project Manager, myself, Sharon Wetzig, um, Steph Dickinson, who is the Learning and Development Coordinator role, and we have to acknowledge that this is Steph's last webinar with us as she's moving on to new things, but we're really grateful, Steph, for your uh, many sessions input in the back, um, the uh, unseen side of the webinar, and then also in presenting as well, so we appreciate that. And we've got Linda Carnew as well, um, our research senior researcher. Um, we do have a Zoom poll as well, just to... Um, find out a little bit more about you. So if we can start that um, coming up on the screen, that would be great. Uh, I think that's all of the housekeeping today. Uh, we'll give you a little bit longer to, um, to fill in that poll. Um, <clears throat> and we do want to also acknowledge that we have some um, very special guests um, with us today who have come and um, given up their time and um, been very generous with their, their thoughts and ideas and going to share with us about um, the role of allied health in palliative care. So Kylie is going to be introducing them to you um, very soon when we start that part of the topic presentation. Thanks a lot, Sharon. So yes, we are very lucky today to have a number of guest speakers and I will be introducing um, them as their Presenting, So we're going to start off with a bit of a Q&A. We um, put a couple of questions to them and each of them will have an opportunity to respond to those. So our first um, presenter I'd like to introduce is Dr Deidre Morgan, who's a senior lecturer from, from the College of Nursing and Health Sciences at Flinders University and also chair of the Australian Allied Health in Palliative Care. So it's really great that you've been able to come along today to this presentation. So Deidre, I wondered if you could start the conversation um, off with a comment on our first point there. What is, what is broadly the contribution that allied health make in terms of palliative care? I think the contribution that allied health make has changed tremendously in the last 10 years. Um, and I think that, that comes with the change of palliative care extending longer over the disease trajectory. So I think from a, an OT, physio um, and speech path perspective, there is, um, I think, a growing emphasis on non-pharmacological symptom management, um, but specifically, I think, to enable function. And I think that's where allied health are different, that we don't just do an intervention for the sake of an intervention. We do an intervention to enable participation um, in important activities. And I think... What's even more key for me now is when you look at the May data in Canada, um, I think it's about 84% of people for the last two years, and I think last year was over 5,000 people who chose to end their life. 84% choose to do it because they can't do meaningful activities. And, um, and about another 83 because they couldn't do ADLs. So I think that says to me that we have a huge role because we can actually play 
a significant part in remediating that. So it's, I think it's changing. Yeah. So that answer your question. It's, it's, a, it's a part of it. It's a broad oh, question. Yeah, and I think it's certainly in line with that, as you say, that the philosophy and the change of dialogue that we are using palliative care to live well to the yeah. end of life, rather than just to, to support dying. So yeah. it's really living well. Um, and allied health really do have that role of contributing. So mm -hmm. would you like to sort of, and how does Australian Allied Health and Palliative Care support this work as an organisation? So Australian Allied Health and Palliative Care started out of a, the PCA conference in Cairns in 2011, where a group of us got really grumpy because we said, why is palliative care just about nursing and medical? We know it's broader than that. Um, so we really just got grumpy. Um, and uh, we now have over 300 members. Um, so our goal is not to be, um, we're not a special interest group. Um, we do pop out a newsletter once, a, usually every couple of months, um, and a, we have a steering committee that's um, all volunteer, so people do, we do after hours, and we've got a mixture of clinicians and a mixture of academics, um, because we think that that's a, that's a, I have a thing, because I was clinical for such a long time, I have a thing about academics coming in and telling clinicians what to do or what to think or how they should be thinking. So we have, um, but I think together, when we work together, we can have a huge impact on changing practice. So we see ourselves more as having a, an advocacy role. And when, I think one of the big changes was, or the big key achievements was when we first started, APA said there was no reason to have a physio special interest group so one of our members steering committee members actively advocated for that and now there is um, we also now have a greater role advocating up for PCA and would like to really actively contribute to the standards and policy and change things at a at a higher level um, from the national COVID committee um, the Cochrane COVID committee so we're on quite a few different committees that we um, and we'll often tap people on the shoulder and spe seek specific opinions and things so that we can be feeding up what's currently clinically relevant. I think some of your advocacy work, you were referencing some of the work that's been done by the WHO and really recent references around rehabilitation yeah. and being able to bring that in line with Australian work. Yeah. So as of as recently as last week, um, the WHO, that's a good way because I, I always get stuck saying World Health Organisation, um, released a document called Quality Health Services and Palliative Care, Practical Approaches and Resources to Support Policy, Strategy and Practice. And I'm just going to get to the blurb. So what they've said, and this is um, the first time I've seen anything like this, is that um, palliative care requires a broad multidisciplinary approach that includes rehabilitation defined as a set of interventions designed to optimise functioning and reduce disability in individuals with health conditions in interaction with their environment. Um, improving person's function, rehabilitation can cut ongoing care costs and may prevent avoidable hospital admissions, length of stay and complication risk. Now that to me is super exciting because we can then use that to argue up um, for policy change um, for allied health. So that that's, I, I think there is going to be a, a, a growing role uh, for allied health, um, but we have to also be vocal about it um, and get ourselves into the spaces so that people know we, we're too nice and we're too busy doing the do, I think. <laughs> I definitely agree, you're very busy. It is um, a challenge. And I think I could certainly see a lot of nods from the other allied health um, members in the, the panel today. So, yeah. And I, I think especially at the moment, people are, are being hammered um, with COVID, especially down the East Coast. When I, I talk to allied health and nursing and medical, everybody's exhausted. Um, and, and I guess, you know, for me, part of our HPCs, while we can't change things, is is to still be a, a, a positive voice and just help people hold ground while they negotiate what's happening with lockdowns and um, or lack of lockdowns and increase in hospitals. Um, and, and I think the lack of acknowledgement of allied health role. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's an aside. But, yeah. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, I would like now to open the discussion out to our other speakers. And Dr. Bernie Bissett is Discipline Lead Physiotherapy, Faculty of Health, University of Canberra. Um, so Bernie, would you like to comment on the, the role that allied health and in particular physiotherapists 
having palliative care and therefore what are the knowledge and skills that are important to develop in the undergraduate students? Yeah, thanks, Kylie. I think just following on from what Deidre said before, I think there's been a real evolution in our understanding of, of what physios can contribute in this space. And I think about when I was, you know, at in university 25 years ago, we didn't get taught anything about mm -hmm. death and dying and palliative care. It was, it was just you learnt what you learnt by potluck being on placement. And what we are seeing now with our undergraduate students going out onto placement is that wherever they're going, be that the acute surgical wards, be that into the community, be that into rehab facilities, they are all encountering quite often people who are dying. And so the skills that we are hoping to share with them through the PCCP materials in particular is, is really having an impact. Um, I was saying to Kylie just the other day that, um, you know, it's absolutely every year, I've been teaching the materials for quite a few years now, and every year without fail, I'll get an email from some recent graduates or some students on placement going, oh, wow, Bernie, I know at the time that, you know, we thought, why are we learning about all of this? But I really had to use some of those knowledge and skills. And I'm so glad we talked about this, you know, in the classroom. And I'm so glad I had some insight. So, so whether we like it or not, our students, even if they think, oh, I'm going to be the world's best you know, musculoskeletal physio, on the way through, they're going to encounter some of these patients. So I think it's really key that they understand that a lot of the skills that we bring, particularly around managing breathlessness, we are, as a profession, we are getting so much better at what we can offer in terms of breathlessness management. Um, and, and really, as Deidre said too, focusing on function, we talk about understanding what the patient's goals are, and their goal might be, I just want to sit out in the chair so that when the grandkids come and visit, I can, you know, I'm not just stranded in the bed, you know, and that can be a really important functional goal for them. And so really aligning our treatment goals, not with some prescriptive pathway, but much being much more um, patient-centred in our approach. And so I think physios can offer a lot in terms of obviously the physical assessment, but in terms of the skills and attributes that we need to teach our, our graduates at, I think it really does come down to being patient-centred, also being mindful of their own views of death and dying and what that brings to their interactions and having that reflective ability to cope when they're dealing with people who are dying. So I think there's lots of layers to it. I think we are still learning how to do that well, but I, I do very much see that physio is playing an important role in this space. And I'm very pleased to hear that the whatever reluctance we had as a profession about, oh, that's not our space, we are breaking down some of those barriers. Um, and moving forward because at the end of the day I think patients can really benefit if we all combine our skill sets to to give them the best end of life that they can possibly have however long that might be. That's great and as you said breathlessness is certainly one of the a very scary symptom that our patients are experiencing so you know, that's fantastic. Thank you for that summary. Um, would also like to now introduce Dr Jennifer Ong who's a lecturer at the University of Sydney School of Pharmacy and Jen, so from a pharmacy perspective, I know you're going to explore the role further in your presentation, but could you comment on what are the knowledge and skills that are required for undergraduate pharmacy students? Yes, yeah, so um, in pharmacy, well, at the University of Sydney anyway, it's still very early days for us in terms of incorporating um, a palliative care component into the curriculum. Um, but for the moment, there is a little bit of a focus on um, opioid dose calculations, um, complex uh, medication management. Um, but I suppose if, if I had a magic wand or if I had things my way, the five star, um, five star pharmacy graduate would be able to anticipate transitions of care, anticipate um, I guess the common symptoms that do occur towards the end of life and to be able to recommend, um, I suppose, recommend um, or start de-prescribing medication. So when medications are no longer needed to perhaps initiate the conversation that perhaps we should remove the chemical burden um, in, in, a, in a person's um, treatment management and um, to also be able to work with other other um, disciplines um, for a more holistic approach because um, there is a huge focus in I suppose physical um, physical care and there's a lot of attention um, growing for um, mental health um, but there's also the spiritual and cultural aspects that um, it, it would be wonderful for pharmacy students to know when to um, I guess, refer and consult others and I suppose work as a, a, a healthcare team um, to, to really take care of a patient at the end of life. Yeah. 
Yeah. There's a lot of complexity there, isn't there, in terms of their activity. Deep prescribing, it's not just that black and white skill. There's a lot of emotion in that decision-making and moving and forward. And negotiating with family members because um, it can be seen as a sign of um, the healthcare team giving up at times. Um, so, again, we need to nav navigate that quite carefully as well. Yeah. That's great. Thank you very much for that. Um, I'd now like to introduce uh, Jessica Ruffinelli who is a lecturer in Occupational Therapy at the School of Allied Health, ACU. Um, so what contribution are occupational therapists making in palliative care? It's a, a tough gig to follow Deidre, who's provided some of that background. But um, yeah, pass over to you now, De Jess. Yes, and I saw that yeah, about academics coming in and preaching um, the way to do it to clinicians. So my, my disclosure is I was an acting clinician in pell care up until about three, four years ago and then moved into academia. Um, <laughs> but my heart's still in pell care. Um, but I just wanted to start. So in terms of contribution of OT, I always want to put the human face there. So I'll just put um, a short, really short spiel about uh, one of my first patients I ever had in London, older cockney lady, chain smoker, had been diagnosed with lung cancer, opened the front door. And I learned later on, she had a really rebellious and independent spirit. And she opened the front door and said, just because I'm dying doesn't mean I have to stop living. And this is my introduce, introduction really to working in the world of palliative care in that the people don't change being who they are just because we're getting involved. So we have to meet them really where they are. And her response was very much in, response to being morally cold by her GP who'd said, you know, you've got to stop smoking, you can't go out, you can't do this, you can't do that, can't do this, and really wrapping her in wool just because she had lung cancer. So that's really stuck with me and I've tried to give that to my students. So we know from the literature that your desire to participate in valued occupations actually increases towards end of life. It doesn't diminish. Um, it's intensified. It's a basic human need. And it's really significant if you want to prevent complex grief issues for the family, if you want to help someone transition um, towards this idea that actually their life will end and they are terminal, you do need to actually do that through occupation as almost a therapeutic method. Um, so occupational therapy uh, Australia has actually put out a position statement in 2015. And it's interesting that they actually have eight points in terms of what the role of an OT is. So everyone automatically thinks OT just prescribes equipment and that's our job, off you go. But actually that was only part of one small point in terms of what the OT role actually is. And the one that I wanted to highlight today that people aren't probably aware of is really looking about our role in terms of optimizing a person's function within their family and support networks to really provide dignity and choice and control at a time where they probably don't have a lot of control or choice um, through, often there's issues that you can't solve, you can't fix it, but what can we control? What can we give back in terms of dignity, choice and help them identify goals and continue to goal set even if we know that the person isn't going to get better? Um, and then it's really looking at things like leaving legacies. So that's part of the role that I used with my Cockney lady in terms of okay, how do we leave a legacy for your family to remember you by? What do you really want to do in the time you have left? And that's still a valued occupation. Obviously, we're restricted within um, funding and environmental policies and things like that from the workplace and things. So we will often be focusing on your prescription equipment for a symptom control. So for example, the common ones bath lifts to get someone into a bath so that they can relax and um, deal with anxiety and pain and things like that. But then we'll also really look at um, other things like people who just want to get to a pub and what sort of equipment do they need to get there, but also how are they going to tolerate sitting out in a wheelchair for a certain period of time? Is that pub accessible? How do you deal with this idea that people are looking at me and I may not look normal to who I used to be and that change of role, relationship, self-identity? So to me, occupational therapists are super lucky because we get to use occupation to really help that sort of counselling, movement, grief, relationship management um, aspect. Because by doing your day-to-day -day activities, you can start to open up some of those conversations. So to me, OT is, yes, we wear equipment, but I feel like we have a lot more to also offer. And so how do you sell that to undergraduate students? How do you build, what capabilities do you need to build in them to, to undertake those roles? Yeah, so it's a hard one, particularly if there's a lot of anxiety and concern. I agree with um, what, um, oh, my screen's moved around. Um, this is, um, I've forgotten her first name, is it Maggie? Bernie. Bernie, Bernie Bigson. 
were saying that um, a lot of the OT students view OT as being, you know, you work in VOC rehab or you work in pediatrics or you work in NDIS. They don't realize that actually every single domain of OT, you will work with someone who's probably dying. Most likely you're going to come across someone. That's the nature of life. And that's the nature of the work we're working with. So it's about normalizing it. It's a normal process. Uh, if you look at your bread and butter OT skills of assessment, your um, prescription, um, your conversation relationship skills, your coaching, bread and butter OT skills you can actually use throughout palliative care. And I always say to them, it's palliative care is just OT. You may need to be doing a little bit faster. You may need to be more responsive. You may need to be more aware of complex medical conditions and um, interacting comorbid conditions. But really at the, bound, at the foundations, it's just OT. And then you may just be needing to seek guidance and extra assistance to work out those other complexities around it and some of the forward planning, some of the planning for deterioration instead of improvement. But on that, to me, it's an OT essential role that should be embedded in every single aspect of that course and that unit because it doesn't matter where you work, you're going to find health care. Good foundational skills, aren't they? That mm. can be applied. Excellent. Thank you very much for that summary, um, Jess. Um, we now have um, each of our guest speakers has prepared a presentation to give some background into some of the palliative care teaching um, that they're doing in their own environments. So I'll hand over to Bernie to showcase some work that she's done with VoiceThread. It's really interesting. Thanks, Bernie. Thanks, Kylie. Um, so just for some context, I've been teaching the physio students at UC for oh, probably as long as PCCPU has been around. Actually, I think I was an early adopter. Could we say that, Kylie, probably? That, that would describe <laughs> me. Um, and I remember when I, when I first saw the materials, I thought, oh, this is brilliant. I'm going to grab this. I'm going to run with it. I brought I thought, yep, I'll, I'll grab it. I'll do some lectures. So I prepared two lectures. I could fit three hours of content. Great. I'll do some lectures. Then I'll do tutorials. I'll get the students to sit around. We'll all talk about death and dying. It's going to be fabulous. I was so enthusiastic. And I remember I walked into my classroom. I'd prepared all my tutor notes inspired by these resources. We sat around and I said, right, so let's, let's talk about, you know, tell me a time when somebody you know has died. And they all just looked at me absolutely nothing back. I got zero engagement. And I thought, oh my gosh, by the time I get to ask them about spirituality and religion, this is going to go nowhere fast. And I was right. Like it was, even though these students kind of knew each other, it was, it was almost too hard. And I thought, I'm going to have to rethink how I do this. How am I going to get them to actually open up and give some real decent answers to these questions? And meanwhile, I discovered through some other uh, colleagues in a different faculty, this program called VoiceThread. And I'm just going to give an apology to anybody who's already used it. It was brand new to me. But the whole point of VoiceThread is having a platform where students can come and interact with slides and leave either voice or video comments, and it's not real time. So it's not like a virtual classroom insofar as you expect people to chime in and it's all recorded. They have the option of making a recording of their, their speech or their video, and then only when they're happy with that, clicking, yep, yeah, I'm going to upload that. And the point is that you can organise it in terms of tutorial groups so that they can actually stop, listen to each other, reflect on each other's comments. And I thought, okay, let's give this a go. And so several years ago, um, that's what I did. And so I'd like to share with you, I'm literally just gonna share my screen to show you what the platform looks like and, and you will recognize very quickly um, some very familiar resources. So this is my home screen for voice. So hopefully you can see it's here. So I've got these palliative care reflective tasks. Each one of these boxes um, is a, a different tutorial group. So this is from my um, last semester last year. Down here you can think, what's with the beach scene, Bernie? So I do a little introductory kind of activity where they just go, hey, um, actually, I'll just jump into it so you can see. And you see, this is me talking to them. I'll just stop that because I just wrap it on. So basically, like, here's a beach scene. Come and show you. Know, tell me where you're going to live on the beach. So I do this really like non-confronting, just get to know to use a platform. Down here, that's me. And you can see each one of these is a different student that's chimed in and told me where I'd find them on the beach. So that's just the interactivity. So once they've got that and they understand how to use the platform, then I'll show you. I'm not going to actually play my students' responses just out of respect for them and their sort of privacy. But this is the actual um, slides that you would see. Now, this is you just prepare slides like in PowerPoint, upload them. It is so easy. Um, it's only worth 5% of their grade. They have to interact with each of the slides. Here's a little blurb um, about what's expected. And you will see, I'm just going to pause that uh, little student talking there. And the first thing I'm asking them is, okay, so do you have direct experience of death and dying in your personal life? How did these experiences affect you? This is exactly the same question I was asking in the tutorial classroom, except this way, 
It was they could do it in the privacy of their own home. They could do it sitting in their pajamas in their bed. I didn't care. Um, quite a lot of them just did um, recordings of them talking rather than videos. Some of them like to do videos, but mostly it was just recordings. And the very first year I, I did this, I was like, what are they going to do? Are they just going to give me three word answers and move on? What I didn't realize is that in this format, I needed to sit there with a box of tissues when I listened because, oh my goodness, the stories that they shared, the way that they opened up and described their experiences of death and dying. And every year, without fail, I've got students describing close friends or family members who have died from suicide. I have had students who used to be in the Defence Force in Afghanistan talking about the experiences of walking past literal landmines and dealing with the debris of human bodies. And, you know, just, you know, my, my grandfather died of cancer, you know, just last month and I had to go and visit him and this is what I saw. Like the spectrum of experience is extraordinary. And one of the things I love about this is that within these tutorial groups, I'll have quite an age range. I'll have, you know, 20 year olds that are pretty much straight out of high school and I'll have people in their forties who are having a career change into physio. And so within that group, there will always be some that have no experience of death and dying. And so it's actually a beautiful peer learning opportunity for them to think about, oh, wow, there's lots of different, you know, exposures that people have had and how they've affected them. So even if they haven't experienced death and dying, they can still kind of reflect on each other's um, perspectives and contribute to the conversation. So it's, it worked brilliantly. Um, let me just keep moving through these slides here for you. So I've just got to move everybody's faces because they're just in the way. <laughs> okay. Um, so this is the one about, um, let's talk about what's in the media. I show them a clip from Grey's Anatomy they can have a little look at and then they'll chime in with their ideas. Um, we talk about is modern society, death denying, death avoiding. I know you're all familiar with all these prompt questions. You can see I've cherry picked the ones that I think are going to be quite good discussion topics. We absolutely talk about culture. This has been fascinating for me. I feel like I was so privileged to hear about all the different backgrounds the students bring. I've learned a lot about some different Aboriginal experiences. I've learned a lot about Korean cultures and the importance of, you know, uh, totally different uh, death and dying rituals that I had no idea about. It's been actually a really amazing experience. And the students, again, are learning from each other. Um, and this is one, I know there's a question in the chat just before about, do you actually talk about spirituality do you talk about religion yeah this is an opportunity obviously I've given them some background and context in the lecture but this is where the students you know again surprise me with how deeply they go into this discussion and people who wouldn't necessarily even describe themselves as religious are able to tease out but these are the things that are important to me and these are the things that give me comfort and these are maybe the routines or the rituals that that help me in, in points of crisis and again I've never had a student just dismiss it and go, well, that's not important. That's just, you know, and, and, and kind of just move on. There's always, it's always been done in a really respectful way. And I wonder if it's because I'm not chiming in there. I'm not, I'm not contributing. I'm just letting the students have this discussion almost without me, without it being in real time. It almost becomes like self-moderating. I think that, that, you know, so long as a couple of people are respectful and supportive um, that, you know, it, it, it seems to, to balance itself out quite nicely. And it's, it's genuine kind of adult peer learning at its best. Mm -hmm. um, and so this last one, we talk about, you know, what specific interventions might physios include as part of end of life care? How do physio physios know when it's appropriate to seek physio treatment altogether? This is stuff. This is the, this is the gray zone tricky stuff. Like, you know, there's no obviously one right answer here. And they do talk about, okay, well, in class, we learned how to do a nasopharyngeal suction. Maybe sometimes that would be the right thing, but maybe, you know, if the patient was distressed or, the, you know, we had to talk about the family and, you know, there's some, there's some really great deep learning kind of conversations that happen here. And this last one I love as well, they share some self-care strategies. Um, and this is quite variable as well. They're drawing on some of their life experience. They're some of them are projecting into the future. If I'm caring for a lot of patients, what might I do? Who would I talk to? Um, and I think, you know, it's, it's really great to hear them um, yeah, just sharing their experiences in that way. So you can see I've really stuck quite faithfully to the questions and, and the principles of the PCC for you resources. I haven't done anything except put it into this platform and kind of sat back and said to the students, off you go, let's do this and see what happens. What has been really extraordinary to me has been the way that the students authentically sharing and responding has, but you, can, you can hear in the students' voices or read it in their, you know, in their responses, they, they have been really affirming of each other. Um, they have been very kind to each other. They have opened up in a way that they wouldn't have in a classroom necessarily. 
um, you know, the students jump on and just say, oh, thank you, James, for sharing that story. I can't believe you've had to go through that even this last semester. We had no idea. Sometimes they're like, if you ever need a coffee, just let me know. Like they kind of take it to a next level. And I see little glimmers of maybe the supportive health professionals they are going to become. So um, it's really tricky because, you know, how do I grade that? How do I give it a score? How do I you say, oh, that's a high distinction, that's a pass? You know what I don't? Most of the time I'll give them five out of five if they're coming on and just making respectful um, contributions. And I think this is one of those things that the value isn't in, you know, an academic grade. The value is in the attitude that we're instilling in them and the receptiveness to thinking beyond their own worldview, to being aware of different perspectives and for being really ready to confront these realities when they're out in the workplace and, um, and treating patients. So I'm just going to stop sharing my slide, my screen now. Um, but I just really wanted to, I'm, I'm certainly not saying that is the only way to do it, not at all. This is just one approach that has really worked for me and my physio students. And as I say, year upon year, I'm really, you know, really impressed by the, the way that students have embraced it. And I think that of all the activities that we do, pivoting this one to online has actually been one of those rare occasions where it's better than the face-to-face -face approach. I mean, from a physio who likes her hands-on teaching, I know that's a lot to say, um, but certainly this has been a lesson for me that some things can be done better online. And if anybody was interested in finding out more about how to do it. It's look, I am not a tech guru at all. It's I'm a complete gumby, if I'm honest. Um, it's a really stri quite straightforward um, platform to use. I've never had any issue. Um, so, you know, if you want more information, I'm happy to, to share that. But I hope that's maybe just given some people some ideas about what can be done in that space. That's fantastic. Thanks, Bernie. And I, I think in one of the earlier days, you, you've done an evaluation and did get some quite positive feedback and comparative to face-to-face -to -face versus the voice thread. Um, and I've got that poster on our website as well, and we can share that as well. But certainly it's, it is the evidence did bear it out that the students got a lot more out of it as well. So uh, that's great. Thank you very much for that summary. Um, in light of time, I will move on to Jennifer, um, Jennifer Ong. So you've got some interesting work underway at the moment. Yeah, so um, thank you again for inviting me um, to talk about what we're doing um, in farms in terms of the PCC for you um, resources. I'm just trying to share screen. Uh huh. Share. Okay. Yeah, excellent. Um, so as mentioned earlier, it is very early days still. Um, so we're pretty much in phase one of incorporating um, PCC for you materials into the pharmacy curriculum. And this is sort of just um, a couple of slides, um, I suppose, looking at what we found out by implementing the pre-intervention questionnaire with our fourth year students at the moment. Uh, let's see if this works. Cool. So uh, just a little bit of background. Uh, the New South Wales government have uh, recently identified that building palliative care knowledge, skills and capabilities of community pharmacists is a key focus area, particularly with keeping people in the community should they wish to receive care in the community. And they've identified uh, community pharmacists as uh, being a very useful resource. Uh, not only um, in terms of medication management and the medication expertise, but also triaging and signposting what could be a very tricky time um, for people. But in that, uh, it's been identified that we need more resources, more knowledge, more skills, more training, more capabilities um, built in to uh, community pharmacy. And so some of the literature has highlighted uh, learning needs of practicing pharmacists in Australia. Uh, and there have been um, pain and palliative care competencies in terms of uh, tertiary education. Uh, however, this uh, is mainly aimed towards postgraduate students undertaking their clinical placements and it's in a US setting as well. Uh, so in terms of the undergraduate setting, uh, and these stats are quite uh, uh, possibly outdated now, um, but it's probably the most recent one we have, but uh, palliative care components are incorporated to a minor or if not at all uh, for a majority of allied health courses in the undergraduate curriculum in Australia and, and allied health would include uh, some uh, pharmacy disciplines in there as well. 
and in terms of pharmacy courses specifically, uh, about half of them at the time of writing uh, did indicate an intention to review or implement uh, PCC for You resources in their own curriculum. Uh, so a little bit of uh, background on the Bachelor of Pharmacy slash Bachelor of Pharmacy Management course at the University of Sydney. Um, as you can see, there's um, not a great deal. <laughs> uh, a lecture in second year about um, general attitudes uh, to health or about health and I suppose illness uh, and in third year they get two one-hour lectures um, introducing the principles of palliative care and that really is just the essence of what the pcc for you uh, materials um, encapsulate um, but one hour lecture is all we had so one hour lecture is what we've done um, and we've also got a, another lecture on supportive care, uh, common, common symptoms at end of life and certain medications that students may uh, see and use in, in that sort of setting. We've also um, put a slightly, uh, a bit of a palliative care spin in, in integrated into one of the prostate cancer tutorials in third year as well. Uh, so not so much focus on palliative care uh, independently per se. Um, so we we see this as a three stage project. Uh, what we'll be looking at today is the explanatory uh, oh, uh, exploratory stage. Uh, so we we were just interested to understand um, baseline needs, baseline education needs of our students. And so we're hoping that will inform uh, future pharmacy curriculum development and naturally to implement and evaluate that accordingly. Um, so they're just the aims there. And the approach we took was pretty straightforward. So we selected students in their final year um, on the brink, I suppose, of graduation and practice as interns. We utilised the PCC for you uh, pre-intervention questionnaire. Um, we did uh, descriptive statistical analysis and Man Whitney U tests uh, for the quantitative data and some thematic analysis for the uh, responses to open-ended questions. Um, so <laughs> this is uh, typical, a typical response rate for our pharmacy students. So 45, it's not that high, but in terms of um, responding to any form of survey, including the course surveys, 45% is um, typical. Um, the good thing is I did compare this with uh, data that we have on the entire cohort, and it is representative. Um, the median age is about 22, and the majority of females in the cohort is about 69, and there is uh, quite a significant proportion who identify as culturally and linguistically diverse. Um, in terms of background. Uh, so although most students had experienced a life limiting illness themselves or known a close friend or family family member who has, um, a majority of them never have never or had hadn't provided uh, hadn't personally provided care in the past 12 months for someone who had died. Um, a majority of them um, hadn't observed care or discussed end of life care um, with people with life limiting illness and or their families either. Uh, so in terms of the uh, quantitative data, um, pharmacy students pretty much reported that they were moderate to less than moderately confident in terms of knowledge, confidence and preparedness. And I suppose that's not too surprising considering how I suppose relatively little time we put towards um, teaching palliative care explicitly. Um, and similar results uh, were found across all 19 graduate capabilities uh, listed outlined in PCC for you. Um, so uh, thematic analysis uh, revealed three major themes and um, this was thematic analysis on responses to the question, uh, please explain how your palliative care experience and training has or has not 
prepared you to care for people who have a life limiting illness and their families. And so uh, the, the first theme, which is I uh, suppose encouraging is students felt more confident with symptom and medication management. Great, it's core business. Um, this is also supported by the um, quantitative data as well. So the green and blue bar indicate uh, confidence levels um, to perform certain tasks. And so for the first three items, which correspond to answering patient and family's questions about effects of certain medic medications, um, managing patient pain and other symptoms, um, you could see that students were confident to perform with minimal consultation or um, confident to perform uh, independently. And so that's for more than half the respondents um, who were quite confident. Um, the second theme, however, did reveal that students were less confident about discussing sensitive issues with patients and family. And um, this is a major part in palliative care to be able to connect on a on a human level rather than seeing them as a, a, collect, a collection of symptoms and a collection of medications, but rather um, their goals of care, uh, which becomes crucially important, especially in palliative care and end of life. Um, and again, it's supported by the uh, quantitative data um, where the orange bar would indicate needs further basic instruction and the uh, pink bar uh, indicates confident to perform with close supervision or coaching. So for the two items highlighted, they correspond with answering family, uh, patient and family's questions about the dying process and discussing patients' wishes for after their death. So you could see that students would prefer a, either close supervision or more basic instruction on how to do that. Um, yeah, and so the third theme revealed that um, they, they, want more, um, they want more exposure, they want more content coverage, and um, specifically some students have indicated more practical experience. Um, theory is great, um, application is hard. Um, and that came across very strongly in the thematic analysis. Um, we also noticed that some learning activities uh, did um, statistically and statistically significantly improved um, some um, graduate attributes or capabilities as well as preparedness. So um, problem-based slash case-based learning is associated with um, higher preparedness. Um, tutorials, clinical placements, and self-directed learning did increase some aspects of interacting with patients um, or confidence associated with that. Um, and self-directed learning is associated with more confidence in managing symptoms other than pain. So with that, um, we're hoping to um, pretty much increase more coverage in palliative care in the, in the curriculum. And um, we've earmarked a, a two hour, an additional two hour tutorial in fourth year to uh, embed more PCC for you resources for um, the pro in, in a problem based slash case based learning format. Um, and it's almost ready to use straight out of the packet. So the four modules that have been created, they're all based on a, 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 a patient and a case study. So that's perfect. Um, and we hope to implement this and evaluate it early next year. Um, that's fantastic. Yeah, so that's everything. So thank that's you. Great. Thank you very much for that. And we certainly were looking forward to continuing to work with you on that and with the final valuation. So that sounds great. We'll follow that through. And we'll get another update end of next year. Fingers <laughs> crossed. Yeah, that's brilliant. Thank you. Um, I'd now like to invite Jessica. I have noticed that Helen Badge has also jumped on the line there as well from um, the ACU OT program. And I'll let you discuss your reflection on the OT program there. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you. So when we were asked a couple of weeks ago to come and join you today, Helen and I had a little bit of a panic because we're thinking, oh, are we the gold standard in teaching pell care for OT students in Australia? And I was just a little bit of that heart moment. And so we went out and had a look at the literature. 
And it seems very consistent with what Jennifer was saying too. So on average, OT courses seem to only teach between two to 10 hours of Pell Care material across the four year degree. Not a huge amount. And I'm on my little, put my little advocate hat on saying that I don't think it's enough. And Helen very strongly <laughs> feels the same way. And it seems very much on par. It looks like 75% of OTs, so this is a slightly older study back in 2010, but 75% of OTs don't feel prepared to work with people who are at end of life. And less than 45% actually remembered having any sort of training at all. So they might've had it, but whether it was actually embedded and stayed there is another matter. And I could see quite a lot of the literature for OTs and the use of OTs within palliative care and how prepared students felt all seemed to link back to CC, uh, PCC4U. And I actually remember when I, back in, I think it was early 2005, 2006, 2007, when UQ and Curtin University were doing a lot of the original research mm -hmm. um, around healthcare and OTs and um, all that sort of thing. I was a student at the time, and I remember some of that going out um, at the time. However, it's nice to see we've seen some gains since then, and there has been some movement. But I very much see the role of OT, uh, palliative care and OT education is still very much on that journey. So I don't think we're quite there at gold standard yet, but I will talk you through what we do. So ACU, the Australian Catholic University has a bit of a, what's called a spiral curriculum. And I have to thank the PCC for you staff for giving me that terminology when we discussed our training methods. And it's really about implying and then building the skills within the curriculum and throughout the course. So, Helen teach, we'll talk to you in a minute about her third year subject where she teaches um, neuroscience and neurology. So she looks at a lot of those um, in palliative care within those um, conditions. And then I teach into the aged care unit. And within that unit, I have a two hour self-paced workbook that I do and the two hour tutorial. So it's not a lot of material. Helen has roughly about the same sort of time. But when I talk to some of our other staff, it seems like the majority of units, if you're doing a case study or a presentation, there's usually one case study that will be palliative care focused among a range of about six or seven. So the students are having um, knowledge and integration into pell care without being overtly obvious and aware of it. So if we're teaching, for example, working with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander um, communities and their cultural practices, there's probably one case study that's got pell care involved in it, but it may not be an overt focus on that. It's within the counselling unit and those sorts of things. Um, which in some ways is actually nice because it embeds it within the course, it makes it more normalised. Uh, the PCC for you materials, we do use some of the videos, we do use um, some of the reflection um, tasks you've done because we don't have the time, we don't have time to actually roll it out as it's prepared, but we cherry pick, we've um, stolen or, or borrowed quite a few of your ideas and comments along the way. And what we've found, particularly in the aged care sector, is a lot of our students are scared. They're really scared of this idea of death and dying. They, to the point where they'll actually request not to attend this tutorial because they're scared it's going to trigger that memory they have of when their granddad died or mm -hmm. such and such happened, or they just don't have the exposure out there, particularly nowadays where, I mean, the second years I was teaching today, 18 months of their degree has been online because of COVID. Wow. So COVID means that they're going to have more increased exposure to death. However, they're having less of those skills and that knowledge, and it's all very sterilized. So a lot of what we're starting is really with the basics, starting to talk and name and use the language and find out it's okay. And what's been particularly helpful from PCC for you is more of the webinars, like today, where you come up with these great resources. So I'm going to steal one that Bernie had in terms of voice thread. But to us, that seems to be more the foundation of my teaching material rather than the actual developed resources. And to me, that shows you the community that's out there. Um, so pcc for you is more our background boundary sort of sparking discussion sort of material. And then we use other resources on top of that. So a really good one we love to use is Dying to Talk card game. So that's by Palliative Care Australia. And that's beautiful because as you go through a deck of cards, it makes you categorize how important is something to you. So your ability to do your own self-care at end of life, how important is it to you? And you have to actually label it. And then how important is it to you to not have um, uh, certain medications? How important is it to you to die at hospital versus home? And it really is confronting to students and we make them do it in their own time, in their own little space, because actually they've got to start thinking about some of the things that we're asking our patients when we do advanced care planning, 
which OTs have a role in, they haven't flipped it back on themselves. They're actually thinking about what's important to themselves on a personal level before they can put it into practice. Um, so that's one resource we love because it gets it out there in the open. And the other thing I've been really working on is a tool where we've done some recordings with OTs out in the field because we're aware that we're academics, so we want to get the current, current day practice. And we're aware of the anxieties of students going out in placement. So we've done some beautiful recordings with people like Jenny Burke, who wrote the OT position statement, asking about what's it like in real life and what lessons do they have from the field. And that's what seems to be the students are responding to the most, is seeing that practical application as opposed to the theory basis, which aligns with what Jennifer was saying too, which is nice to hear. They want the practical rather than just the theory. So our general focus is also to link it to the competencies. And luckily the um, Australia, uh, Australian Catholic University graduation or graduate attributes and our philosophies are very palliative care focused in some ways. There's a lot of alignment there because if you're a Catholic university, you're focusing on spirituality, you're focusing upon service and giving and all these sorts of things. And a lot of them really closely align beautifully. So I'll be putting my advocate hat on so I've only been at ACU just over a year now and really looking to build palliative care further. But to me, it's about normalising. And the other main thing I really try and look at with the students and the most important lesson I try and give them at the end of the day is you don't have to fix problems. You have to be able to sit with someone in a highly emotional and uncomfortable situation with silences and just listen and not have to fix or solve. OTs love to fix the problem. We love to get whatever fancy gadget we have or technique or strategy and just fix it. So to me, I like to flip it back to the students and say, sit there, don't fix the problem, just listen. And to me, that's a core skill that I hope that the students then take with them. Because I just want them to remember one thing when I ask them in the survey five years from now, did they cover Pell Care? I just want them to have one thing that they're carrying on with them. Um, and just I'll hand over to Helen. Thank you, Jess. And when Jess and I did, I'm sorry I'm late. Yeah, I'm embarrassing uh, lack of daylight savings awareness. Um, Jess and I, when we spoke, spoke about this, because I've only been at ACI a little bit longer than her, so and we were quite shocked at how little there was in the curriculum. So I teach the neuro rehab units for third year students, and literally this is the first formal time that those students recall having been taught palliative care or anything about palliative care. And so we use primarily the videos and then we've actually used not all of the content because again we have two hours in semester one and two hours in semester two but the sort of titles of all of the content for the PCC uh, for you were there. And what we found that spiral approach, which I really like, is we were really drawing on the fact that collaborative goal setting and person-centered care are really fundamental to OT. And we really bring them to when we're working with people who need palliative care at end of life. And it was interesting, I talked to the students this week about a couple of clients that I remember and they said, oh, well, when did you work in pal care, Helen? And I said, well, I never have. Um, only four to 10% of people with a neurological condition that's not related to brain tumour will receive palliative care. So they don't often get access to it. And it's our job in neuro rehab often to be the ones that provide that support or to look at being able to plan for what sort of equipment you need, what do we need to do in the house for when you're no longer as able as you are now. And I think what was interesting was, um, you know, they were talking about, you know, palliative care can start at the time of diagnosis for someone with motor neurone disease, palliative care for someone with Huntington's, they might still have 30 years of life expectancy, but they've known that they might get this for 20 years and they're often providing palliative care to family members. So we need to be really mindful. So Jess and I certainly will go back to advocate for, I think more and more because we, you know, we've just realised that it is such a hard topic. I had lots of students cry last week in there watching the videos and not really know how to handle it um, or not know how to say my role as an OT here would be and that's what we want to be able to bring through their, through their learning as they go into fourth year and become qualified. So I can see we're running tight for time. We wish we could talk for another hour but thanks. <laughs>
We yeah. could put away. No, that's fantastic. And we, I mean, really appreciate your enthusiasm. I think we could probably have a webinar just for each discipline. Yeah. And I think that is a plan moving forward. We're going to have just one discipline focus so we can really explore these, a lot of issues. And um, so that's fantastic. So I wonder, are there any last minute, last sort of comments from the panel at all? I suppose the one thing that I've brought with me, because all my pell care experience has been in the UK and I had to be very targeted to be able to get a job in pell care. I went hunting after it for a good three years before I managed to get into it because everyone who works in pell care doesn't seem to want to move on. They like their job. And the one thing that I love is that it's embedded in their model is very much the integration of the disciplines and the integration of the allied health. My supervisor was a physio. I was supervising a pharmacist actually. And we were within a team that was so closely intertwined. It wasn't the OT department sitting over here and the physio over here, but the integration was absolutely to a point where you could go to any member of that team and get skills and knowledge from any one of them and step up. So if some social worker was away for the day, there was actually some background knowledge there that other people could help with general questions. You're not obviously stepping your role, you're not stepping into their job, but at least you're very well aware of what every other member of the team was doing. And that's where I think these particular forums are good and having the integration is fantastic because I'm learning yeah. a lot about the pharmacy aspects and the physio aspects. And I think that's where we need to be a little bit more integrated as well. Very true, very, very true. Um, I think we probably do need to wrap up. We could talk all day and we do appreciate the time. Final webinar for the year will be on um, the 23rd of November, same time, Queensland time of 2 to 3 p.m. Um, and we will be doing a bit of a wrap up of the year's webinar. So if you've missed um, a few, we obviously do have the recordings available, but if you've missed a few, we're just going to be um, talking about some of the key learnings from um, the webinar topics that we've had and, and perhaps also getting some ideas from you about what you might like to see in our webinars um, for next year. Mm -hmm. So if you aren't already on our Educator Community Hub, um, you can do that just by going to our learning management system, palliativecareeducation.com.au. Uh, it's free to create an account and just um, go to pcc for you and join the Educator Community Hub. Um, any last comments? From you, Kylie. I was going to take over and throw back to that pace slide. Oh, just to sorry. remind everyone about the pace app. Oh, remind, I can go yeah. back there. We'll go back to the pace app um, just to wrap up and show you again just the slide on the pace app directory because certainly worthwhile for um, Allied Health to jump on there and do a search. So the Allied Pace directory, the right resources for the right um, professional groups. Um, you're able to go to pace.org.au and do a search. So you can filter by capabilities, audience, and choose allied health. You can also use the type of resource as well. So that refers to you might be after an audiovisual or the webinars. And you can also search for the CPD certified um, and do a search and find resources that, that are specifically targeted and going to be really relevant and for allied health professionals. Um, and all of the resources on there, we've got 189 at the moment, individual mm -hmm. teaching and learning resources, all from the National Palliative Care Projects. So PCC is up there, but we do have a range of others. So if you're after a specific topic, it might be Allied Health focusing on audiovisual resources in law. And last search, there was five. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so that's um, just a resource to be aware of. So, but other than that, no, I think we should wrap up and let everyone get back to work. Everyone's busy. <laughs> Unless there's some last comments and I wasn't seeing anything. I was thinking the same thing. I think um, initially we had a question in the chat and Bernie answered Bernie that. Did answer Thank that you, one. Bernie. Simulate IPL. Um, someone's got an IPL question. I am going to plug then our IPL um, resource that we've got on our learning management system. It's based on a Health Fusion Team Challenge. Probably be great for OTs because it's based on a um, woman with a brain tumor, yeah? Mm -hmm. um, in community. In community, family, social history, really gives a really rich um, background and assessment information and then some reflective questions to explore um, interprofessional practice and the case um, assessment and also goes There's options to do it as an individual yeah. um, to develop a management plan or in a team um, 
team setting up. So yeah, and we've been able to explore from some of the peer reviewers. We actually got some expert opinions. Mm-hmm. So we've actually got some slides that are from the different disciplines. So really recommend that if you're looking at exploring some IPL activities. Yeah. So where was that available, guys? On our learning management system where the educator community hub is. So if you go palliativecareeducation.com.au, um, you just register on there. And under PCC for you, there's a whole list of courses and you'll see interprofessional learning. Um, And if you want access to the educator resources, which has the um, expert opinions and some um, guides for student extra, I guess, resources for implementing um, the case scenario, then just let us know because we can then enroll you into the educator. Yeah, brilliant. We'll share the link. Yeah, we can share the link, definitely. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for coming along today. And um, a huge thank you to our wonderful panel. Thank you for giving your time and um, for sharing your resources with us and your experiences. We really appreciate that. And um, as Carly said, hope to hear more from you um, again in the future. Fantastic. Thank you, everyone.